This is the world's most dangerous man and you won't believe why. And warning, this gets really scary. Nico Jenkins is a 34-year-old man who's easily considered to be the most dangerous person on earth. Back in August 2014, Nico Jenkins murdered over four people. His first victim was a man named Jorge Luis. Jorge Luis was actually his best friend. His body was in the middle of the road with his phone on Facebook. And the Facebook had a picture of Nico Jenkins. This linked Nico Jenkins to the crime. Right after this, Nico Jenkins went on a spree and killed three more people. This is when police finally caught him and took him to jail. The cops wanted him to serve for all the crime that he'd done, so they put him on death row. But somehow the most dangerous man on this planet escaped death row. If you want to know how he did it, like and follow for part two. Two parents have been found guilty for beating and murdering their own baby on Christmas Day. 10-month-old Finley Bowden was found with 71 bruises and 57 fractures amongst twisted and crushed bones on Christmas Day in 2020. He was found to have a broken pelvis along with broken ribs, not to mention a torn mouth and actual burns on his hands. Paramedics were called on Christmas Day at 2.33 for reports of a cardiac arrest on an infant and sadly he was pronounced dead at 3.45 in hospital. However, it's reported his parents did not call an ambulance for up to one hour because they wanted to smoke cannabis and were trying to hide their drugs. 30-year-old Stephen Bowden and 20-year-old Sharon Marsden were found guilty today on April 14th, 2023 for the murder of 10-month-old Finley. Finley was actually taken out of their care the moment he was born in February 2020, but after they appealed, he was subsequently given back to them and murdered 39 days later. When police went to the house that the trio lived in, they found really grim living conditions with mold inside a baby bottle, toys, bags, and rubbish thrown around the bathroom, in the bathtub, and bedside tables littered with cigarettes and ash. And it's reported just hours after Finley's tragic death, Bowden was telling Marston he was going to sell Finley's pushchair on eBay. His reasoning to the police was to lighten the mood. Now, three years after Finley's death, the pair have been convicted for murder today at Derby's Crown Court in the United Kingdom. We need to talk about this photo. This is what showed up in Emma's house over and over again, asking her the same question every time. The first time Emma saw this creature, she was in fourth grade. She heard a loud noise in her bedroom, followed by faint scratching sounds. She jumped out of her bed and tried to run into her mom's room, and that's when she saw it. Slowly, it moved towards her, its mouth stretching wide open, asking her one question. How old are you? Emma told this creature her age, and it replied, not yet. But the terrifying thing is, this creature came back over and over again. No matter where she moved, every four years this creature would appear in Emma's house. Her mother never believed her, saying it was just a recurring nightmare. But Emma knew something was targeting her, waiting for the right moment. And on the night before her 18th birthday, she was proven right. That night, this creature appeared again, but this time it said something different. It asked Emma, how old are you? And she replied, 17. The creature then stood silently before croaking out the words, next time. Emma turns 21 soon and she's been up every night, paranoid and terrified that any time now she'll find out exactly what the creature meant when it said next time. Like and follow for more. I hadn't heard of the story of Ori Chef, but after looking this up, I'm now really wishing I hadn't heard about this. The story is about this woman, along with a group of people who found her Facebook, as well as something very, very disturbing. To start this off, everything is very normal at first about her Facebook page. She describes herself as a banker, she's a mom, she's married to her husband. But what caught people's attention is that all of her friends are just other profiles of her somewhat calls her out on and she actually responds to it and she says that she just makes extra profiles so she can get a, like in-game rewards for facebook games something like that but this page gets a lot darker and a lot stranger for one it is like littered with graphic posts of animals if you go a bit deeper she also starts talking about wanting to eat people specifically non-adults this entire saga ends with one final post where she puts up a very very chilling image this photo and this photo without context Amigos, I need your help. Please tag as many people down in the comments below and share this video as many times as you can. This is Melissa Lucio and in just a few days, the state of Texas plans to execute her for a crime that possibly didn't even happen. In 2007, as Melissa's family was moving, her two-year-old daughter Mariah fell down a flight of stairs. After the fall, Mariah didn't seem seriously injured, 
Two days later, Mariah took a nap and she wasn't waking up, so the family called 911, but sadly they weren't able to resuscitate her. Just hours after Mariah's death, the police interrogated Melissa for five hours non-stop while she was pregnant with twins. They yelled, threatened, and intimidated her. Melissa asserted her innocence about a hundred times or more. Right now it looks like you're a cold-blooded killer. Now are you a cold-blooded killer no, no. or were you a f The police, however, misconstrued her statements as a confession. Melissa is a lifelong survivor of sexual abuse and domestic violence. Her case has gained the attention and support of celebrities and politicians all over the spectrum who believe Mariah's death was a possible accident. By the way, the district attorney who pursued the death penalty in this case is now serving a 13-year sentence for bribery and extortion. And five of the jurors who voted to sentence Melissa now support relief for her. I am asking you to please click the link in my bio and sign the petition in support of Melissa's children and family who are asking the governor of Texas to spare her life and give her a new trial. I don't want my mom to be executed. I don't want to lose it. What is the truth behind the Teletubbies? Every Teletubby character represents a child subjected to experimental treatments. Lala is thought to symbolize a child with facial deformities, perpetually compelled to exhibit a smile. Tinky Winky's character could be inspired by a deaf child, left tied to an outdoor fence enduring frostbite. Dipsy's character might stem from a constantly ill child who spent much of his time in his own vomit. Lastly, Poe could be derived from a child who encountered a fire accident, which could explain his notable red coloration. This is Crush Your Enemies, one of the worst ISIS execution videos explained. Before I begin, this is a massive trigger warning. The video begins with the victim lying on the ground with his head placed against a rock. The camera then fixates on the victim's face as he waits for the brutality to happen to him. He was sweating extremely bad with the look of fear and sadness all over his face. Two ISIS soldiers can be seen behind him trying to pick up a very large rock. It's extremely heavy and one of the men can't even lift it up. They then drop the rock on the victim's head and you hear this awful cracking noise that nobody should ever hear. And you then see an indent on the side of the victim's head. And it's very clear he immediately suffered traumatic brain damage. His eyes cross and his body goes completely stiff. Blood begins to leak from every place on his face. His nose, mouth, ears, everywhere. After a few seconds, the victim's entire head is covered in blood. He tries to breathe, but huge bubbly blood starts coming out of his mouth, and despite the music playing in the video, you still hear the victim choke and gargle on his own blood as he tries to breathe, which honestly is one of the worst things ever. The victim then tries to lift his head, but he doesn't have the strength to do so. The camera remains focused on him as he withers around the ground and bleeds abundantly. And the video then concludes. This is by far one of the worst and most brutal ISIS videos out there, and I seriously beg you to never go searching for it. The level of brutality in this video is on another level and it blows my mind that humans do this to each other. The man who killed Halloween. Have you ever wondered why parents are so afraid of trick-or-treat candy? Halloween night, 1974, Ronald O'Brien and his neighbor took their kids out trick-or-treating. All was going well until someone didn't open up their door for them. The kids walked away dejected. They weren't getting any candy from this one. Or so they thought. O'Brien came up behind them holding five pixie sticks. He claimed that the man had opened his door after all, it just took him a little while. He handed each of the children a pixie stick and handed one to the neighbor boy. Then they finished trick-or-treating and all went home. Later that night, little Timothy O'Brien opened up his pixie stick and started eating it. He claimed that it had a bitter taste, but his dad gave him some Gatorade to wash it down. Not long after that, he was in the bathroom vomiting and he began convulsing. His father called an ambulance, but it was too late and Timothy died in the ambulance. Follow me for part two. Here are five Santas who are definitely on the naughty list. In 2015, one Brazilian man dressed as Santa stole a helicopter from an aircraft rental service. He claimed he just wanted to surprise someone, so he was dressed in a full Santa suit, beard, and boots. But midway through the flight, he revealed his true intentions, forcing the pilot to fly to a nearby island where he was tied up by Santa and a third man. The two flew away in their new helicopter, and I couldn't find any news articles saying they'd been caught. Those walking around in Berlin, Germany in 2011 might have been thrilled when Santa came up to them offering free drinks in celebration. 
but the excitement didn't last long as these drinks were spiked. Those unfortunate enough to drink them got extremely dizzy, physically ill, and in some cases, they lost consciousness. Despite reward money being offered, this Santa was never caught, though a suspiciously similar event happened again in Berlin a year later. In Atlanta, Georgia in 2004, a man named Elkin Clark was dressed as Santa and selling chocolates. According to Clark, a 74-year-old woman had stolen 29 boxes of candy from him, so he hit her with a 2x4. But apparently witnesses said there was no evidence for robbery. Sadly, the woman did not recover from her injuries and she passed away, so in 2008, Clark was convicted of her death. In 2000, a 35-year-old English Santa at a Christmas display made lots of children cry when he got into a fist fight with a teenager. When authorities were called and Santa was taken away in handcuffs, many of the children waiting in the crowd were in hysterics over the sight of Santa being arrested. There was another Santa that was part of the Christmas show, so police tried to explain to them that that Santa was the real one, and that the Santa they had arrested was just an imposter. In 2015, a man named Randy Lange was dressed as Santa when he began handing out greenery at a Buffalo Wild Wings in Seaside, California. According to reports, he approached customers claiming he had a gift for them before handing them a few nugs. He even left some in the restaurant's tip jar. The police were called, and he was subsequently arrested. What is the Russian sleep experiment? In the 1940s in Soviet Russia, an experiment was carried out on five war prisoners. They were locked in a chamber filled with gas that prevented them from sleeping for an entire month. The first few days were relatively uneventful, but as the days passed, things began to take a horrifying turn. By the ninth day, one prisoner started to scream continuously until his vocal cords gave out. The others blocked the chamber windows, keeping the researchers in the dark about what was happening inside. On the 15th day, the researchers decided to turn off the gas and enter the chamber. What they found was a scene from a nightmare. The prisoners had self-inflicted mutilations, but they were somehow still alive, pleading for the sleep-preventing gas to be turned back on. This pedophile funeral director invited another man to come smoke meth and abuse a corpse with him in a funeral home in England. This story is extremely disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. Meet Nigel Robinson Wright, who was 42 at the time of his arrest. So online, Nigel had a completely different life than in person. In the real world, Nigel was overseeing funerals and helping people deal with the process of death and grief. But online, Nigel frequented pedophile chat rooms. He egged people on who were essaying animals. He chatted with people about his arousal with dead bodies. And he even offered to show up to a man's house who offered him his own toddler to abuse. So these chats eventually got so extreme that they were turned over to the police. And when the police went to Nigel's house, they confiscated all of his electronic devices. And that's where they found some very disturbing things. There were all sorts of different pornographic videos found on Nigel's devices. Videos that involved animals, dogs, children, and yes, corpses. So Nigel was seeking out all of this violent, extreme material on the internet and even commissioning other users to create this content for him. And in those chats, the authorities discovered Nigel and an acquaintance talking about their previous time spent in the funeral home that Nigel managed. Yes, some of these chats were extremely graphic and involved doing things with dead bodies that humans should never be doing. And they talked about how they had done other things all throughout the funeral home, in the chapel, on the benches, everywhere. So at the end of the day, Nigel was sentenced to 17 years in prison. I don't think that's nearly long enough of a sentence, but yeah, he's going to be out, you know, in a decade or so. And judging by this dude's twisted mind and his past on the internet, I definitely don't think it's going to be safe to have him back out in society. Here are some unexplainable photos, part two. In August of the year 1997, members of the Russell family visited their grandmother in the home where she was living. They were later surprised to discover that in the background of this photo they took of her, their grandfather appeared behind her, but he had died three years earlier. Nicknamed the Black Knight, this mysterious space-like object right here has been spotted following an unusual polar orbit. When the drama of John F. Kennedy's assassination unfolded in Dallas November 22, 1963, 
This unknown woman right here was there and filmed the whole thing. But the FBI was never able to locate her. Why was she recording everything and where did she go? This photo shows British war workers escape to the seaside. This photo was taken in September 1943. But in the middle of the photo right here, this guy looks like he's on a cell phone. Pretty cool. So the former NYPD detective started working with a forensic biologist that decided to test if Todd was actually in the lake for three weeks like police say. Together they placed pig carcasses, which is reportedly very similar to human bodies in terms of decomposition, into a pond for three weeks dressed in clothing that resembled Todd's outfit. The carcasses collected aquatic insects within the first day, and by day three, the insects had laid eggs. By day 21, the carcasses completely collapsed from the insect activity, and the clothes were covered in that slimy green film from the water. This test proved that it's extremely unlikely that Todd's body was in the lake for those 22 days. So they gave all of this information to the Michigan State Police in hopes they would reopen and reinvestigate the case, but nothing has really come of it. Kevin Anthony and Michael believe Todd is a possible victim of the Smiley Face Killers. The Smiley Face Killer is a theory, emphasis on theory, of an alleged network of serial killers that targets college age men and dumps their bodies in nearby waterways. They then leave graffiti smiley faces at the death sites. This is controversial, but I figured I'd add this in because multiple people came forward and stated that they saw a smiley face spray painted onto a tree near where Todd's body was found. A card with a smiley face on it was also found on his grave. Todd's mom even believes that he could be a possible victim of the smiley face killers. But the Michigan State Police almost refused to look deeper into this case. They created a petition to reopen Todd's case with the permission of his mom, and it would mean the world to her if he would sign it and join the fight in getting Todd justice. The link is in my bio. What is it that the rich and elite all have in common? Musicians, world business leaders, even U.S. presidents. They all attend the Bohemian Grove. But before I get into this video, if you want a full-length video on the Bohemian Grove, I'm going to post one to my YouTube. If you want to subscribe, the link is in the bio. Okay, so the Bohemian Grove refers to a secretive members-only retreat that hosts a yearly gathering in the woods of California. This secret society is exclusive to only men and has been in existence since 1872. During the encampment, the events that take place are kept hidden from the public and outside photography is strictly forbidden. However, there have been various photos and videos that have leaked through the years showing unusual gatherings and unexplained rituals. The grounds are protected by a year-round security team and very few outsiders have ever been able to get inside. The mystery of these rituals is one that perplexes the outside world. So why do the richest men of the world partake in the Bohemian Grove? Hey, how you doing? I'm about to make you real mad. Joran Vandersloot, this fucking guy, will now reveal how Natalie Holloway died as part of a plea deal, according to his lawyer. In 2005, Natalie was visiting Aruba for her senior trip. She was 18 at the time. Um, she had an encounter with Joran and she was never seen again. Vandersloot has been the only suspect in Natalie Holloway's death since it occurred in 2005. Natalie was initially missing, and after some years, she was finally declared legally dead. Euron has never um, faced charges for Natalie's death. However, he did do some time in prison in Peru for killing another girl. Euron was serving a 28-year sentence for murdering. Euron was serving a 28-year prison sentence in Peru for murdering college student Stephanie Flores when he was extradited to Alabama to face charges for extorting Natalie Holloway's mother, telling her that he would tell her where her daughter's body was if she gave him $250,000. According to an affidavit, Natalie was killed when Euron Vandersloot threw her to the ground when he was walking away from her and she tried to prevent him from leaving. He told representatives for the Holloway family that his father buried Natalie under their home. He later admitted that he had lied about the location of Natalie's body. Vandersloot is set to appear in federal court in Birmingham on Wednesday to enter a new plea. He had previously pled not guilty to attempting to extort the Holloway family. According to his attorney, John Q. Kelly, Vandersloot's plea 
will be conditioned upon him revealing how Natalie died and the location of her body. Vandersloot remains here in the Shelby County, Alabama jail. This is the ISIS tank video, one of the most disturbing videos you should never watch explained. The video begins with the 19 year old prisoner in an orange jumpsuit with his hands tied behind his back. He goes on to explain in Arabic he is a Syrian soldier and a tank driver who used a tank to run over the bodies of the Islamic State soldiers. After the victim finishes this statement, the video transitions and shows an ISIS member in a white robe standing behind him and the man in the white robe reads a statement that says the following. This man ran over the dead bodies of our brothers with a tank. So it has been decided that we will run over him with a tank while he is still alive. About 1 minute and 46 seconds into the video, it transitions to a new segment which is the execution. The video has dramatic music in the background and it resembles a human heartbeat. It then shows the victim walking down the street in one scene and then the tank driving down the road in another. The video jumps again and shows the victim standing in the road with his hands tied behind his back and also his feet tied together so he can't run away. The tank then drives towards the victim and as it gets closer, the victim tries to jump out of the way but is unsuccessful. The tank's tracks then crush the victim as he tries to get away. The camera view then changes and you get a head-on view of the tank tracks running over the victim. After the tank runs over the victim, you see four armed ISIS members cheer as the victim's crushed and dead corpse lies on the road. You then get a close-up of the body which is extremely disturbing. The victim's legs have been completely crushed and you see his mangled feet and legs and also crushed bones. The victim's head has also been completely flattened and destroyed, with brain matter, flesh, and pieces of skull all over the road. You continue to hear the ISIS members cheer in the background as the video concludes. According to reports, this was the first time ISIS used the tank as an execution method, but became a very popular way they executed in the future. Whatever you do, I beg you to never go searching for this video. It's extremely graphic and it's just extremely sickening to watch. It's been almost two decades since a pregnant Lacey Peterson went missing on Christmas Eve. Her husband Scott was later sentenced to death for her murder and her unborn son. Today, Peterson was back in court to be resentenced after his death sentence was overturned. As Jim Murray reports, the courtroom was divided between members from both families who've not been face to face in years. Wife killer Scott Peterson returned to court for another day of reckoning. This just released mugshot shows him as he looks now, age 49. Little change from 17 years ago when he stood trial for murdering his pregnant wife Lacey and their unborn son Connor in a case that riveted the nation. Peterson's family marched into the courtroom. He did see them and gave them a, a big warm smile when he entered the courtroom. Lacey's family was also present but came through a private door. At today's hearing, 16 seats were allocated for Lacey's family and friends and 16 for Peterson supporters. It's the first time Lacey's loved ones have come face to face with her killer in nearly two decades. They heard the judge resentence Peterson to life imprisonment and he is no longer on death row in San Quentin. His original death sentence was overturned. Peterson dumped Lacey's body in San Francisco Bay on Christmas Eve 2002. It was later revealed Peterson had been having an affair with massage therapist Amber Fry. At today's hearing, Lacey's mother told Peterson, I have seen no sorrow or remorse from you at all. Lacey's dead, Scott, because she loved you. She finished up by saying, two facts remain the same all these years later. Number one, Lacey and Connor are still dead. And number two, you killed them. And then she walked off. Lacey's sister Amy told him, there have been so many special occasions that Lacey and Connor should have been here for. It makes me sick being here today in front of you again. Speaking outside court today was Peterson's sister-in-law, Jamie Peterson, who insists he is he innocent. Prison. He's been in prison for over 18 years for a crime he did not commit. Crazy coincidences that you won't believe are true. An author predicted the sinking of the Titanic 14 years before it happened. Robert Morgan wrote The Wreck of the Titan in 1898. And there were definitely some uncanny similarities between the fictional book and the real life events that happened. 
Not only did he name the ship Titan, but both Titan and Titanic mean unsinkable. Both ships ran into trouble after hitting an iceberg on the starboard side of the ship. They were both 400 miles off the coast of the North Atlantic when they sank, both on April nights. Both ships were about 800 feet long, traveling at about 25 knots, and had a capacity of 3,000 passengers, exactly. And in both cases, passengers suffered tragically for a lack of lifeboats. Follow for more.